Now I'm going to continue in the series today on finishing the race. This would be part two of probably what would be at least four parts, perhaps more. Uh, based on the scripture, 1 Corinthians 9.24, when Paul said, Do you not know that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize? And so run that you may obtain. That means we need to run this race, you and I, especially now in the time we're living in, with determination to finish it, and to finish it honestly. 2 Timothy 2.5 says, If a man also strives for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Now, not only do you and I need to run with determination, but we need to run this race truthfully. There are some boundaries to the Christian life. I know that it, we would like it to be a free-for-all race, but it isn't that way. We can't run it that way, and those who try to do these things generally lose their way. Second Samuel chapter 18, please. My message is entitled, A Plea, a plea for Moral Purity. A plea for moral purity. Now, Father, I thank you, God, with all of my heart for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You've sent me today so that prison doors can open, wounded hearts can be healed, and blinded eyes can see, feeble knees can be lifted up and given strength. Now, Lord God, I stand here knowing in my heart that I have something from your throne. I ask you, Lord, that the frailty of this human vessel would not obstruct what you want to speak to your church today. Help me to speak tenderly in the manner that you would speak this to this congregation. Father, I thank you for this, and I thank you for the anointing of the Spirit in Jesus' name. Now, normally when this kind of a topic is preached anywhere, you expect a lot of pulp punching, finger pointing. I'm not here to do that today. I'm not here to moralize in front of you. I'm here to talk to you as a fellow traveler about an issue that the Bible makes very clear is common to all men and women. This issue of morality, this issue of moral cleanliness. Now I'm standing in this pulpit this morning and to the older people I entreat you to hear me. To those that are roughly my age, I'm speaking to you this morning as a fellow traveler and soldier in the army of Jesus Christ. To those that are younger today, I'm speaking to you as a father. And I pray that your heart may be open and that you can hear what the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us. We have to be able to get through the coming days. And there has to be a purity. There has to be a moral purity in the body of Jesus Christ. I'm hoping that as we examine the scriptures today, we're going to go through a lot of the Word of God, that you'll be able to see this, lay hold of it, and become desirable to you. And if you are captivated, you'll find a way out. Verse 33 of 2 Samuel chapter 18. These are the words of King David. And the king was much moved. And he went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Incredibly sorrowful words in the word of God. Oh, would God I had died for thee. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. This is the cry of a broken-hearted man. Even his victories are laden with sorrow. This was supposed to be a victory, but it became filled with sorrow because his own house had suffered, and those that King David loved had paid a terrible price because of his own moral failure. Yes, he was forgiven, but the consequences of his actions are still playing out. He was forgiven. You know, there are certain failings in life that we can seemingly get through rather unscathed. But moral failing is, is of another sort. In Proverbs, the scripture says there's a reproach that doesn't ever fully get wiped away. In David's case, four of his children died because of his own actions. This Absalom was the third. And he knew 
that this was a direct consequence of his moral failure. And that's why even though Absalom rebelled against him and Absalom ended up suspended in a tree with arrows and spears through his body, when the news was brought to him about his son's death, he fully well understood that he was the cause of this, that the devil was allowed into his house and was robbing his strength because of something he had done. And when he got the news, because he must have seen the potential of this young man apparently had tremendous potential, obviously somewhat of a fighter. And David would have known, he would have watched him grow as a young boy and probably saw this potential in his life. And, and because of his own failure, it had turned to rebellion, even against himself. And now Joab had seen to the death of this young man and the news came, a messenger came to him that your, your enemy, which was his own son, is now dead. And this cry came into his heart, Oh, Absalom, would to God I had died instead of you, Absalom. You, my strength has been taken away. And, and instead of sitting in the gate as a king should when there's a victory, he slunked away, slinked away actually into his tent. And sorrow came on the whole camp because of it. And a day of rejoicing was turned into a day of mourning. Job said these words in chapter 31, verses 9, 11, and 12. He said, if, if Job had, is a man who was suffering, and he, he had, he had a, a good theological knowledge. He wasn't complete yet, and we, we see this as we read the book of Job, but he had an understanding of some things. And Job was looking upon the causes of his suffering. And he said, if my heart has been deceived by a woman, or if I had laid wait at my neighbor's door, for this is a heinous crime, it's an iniquity to be punished by the judges. It's a fire that consumes to destruction and would root out all my increase. Now Job said, I lost my children. I lost the increase of my hand, the things that I knew that came from God. And I, I rightly say, if I, had, if I had been deceived and moved into immorality, then, then God, in effect, would be just to take away my strength. Now Job's using this as a counter argument. My strength and my children are gone, but yet I have not been immoral. And he's searching his heart for the reasons why this could have happened in his life and he acknowledges that that is one of them. In America today, in the midst of what appears to be the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression, there is one business, one franchise business that is absolutely booming. According to an article in the February 28th issue of Time magazine, one organization alone, or one franchise of this organization, has grown 10% a year over the last 70 years. So that means when other companies are losing their profit margin, this particular company has gained 70% in its profit margin. And others' revenues grew 50% in last year alone. 50%. Four of the industry's franchises host 5 to 10 million Americans per year. Are, invo are involved in just four of the, the major franchises of this industry. One of these franchises has 1,200 meetings each week, 90% of them in the United States of America alone. You might ask me this morning, what in the world is this thriving industry? What, what is this franchise that's doing so well in America today? Some may even be thinking, wow, where, where, how can we get involved in this? This thriving industry is clinics that are dealing with the sexually addicted in America, in particular. This thriving industry that's it's got this multiple increase, five to 10 million. Now folks, you have to understand, 10 million is only really the number of people that it, of four organizations documented. And that's really just the numbers of people who have the courage to come to a place of saying, we gave into pleasures that we thought we could control, but we've become so captivated that it's taking away our quality of life. We're so alarmed that we're seeking help. These are people who thought they could, they're, they're, they're playing with something they thought they could handle, but it's become a raging fire within them, control, consuming their thoughts, consuming their minds, their, their vision. Every waking moment and even beyond. And they thought they could hold cap of that which now has captivated them. And we're not talking necessarily just about Christian people here. We're talking about people in a broad spectrum of society, men and women, 
so controlled now by out of control desires that they're seeking help and it's in the millions folks these are these are just the beginnings of the, this is only the tip of the iceberg of what has happened in this country and I'm going to show you the root of it and why it is happening Romans chapter 1 please if you'll go there in your Bibles this is a problem of increasing an incredible magnitude in our time Romans 1 17 we'll begin at verse 17 and read through good parts of the chapter for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith that is Romans 1 17 as it is written the just shall live by faith for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness they know the truth I want you to think about this nation for a moment a nation that has made a boast for many years of being Christian or knowing at least the principles of Christianity and in some towns and states and vicinities there's a church almost on every corner you can turn on the radio the television almost any time you can pick up a Bible even in your motel rooms and hotel rooms in a drawer and read it there's so much access to the Word of God we might be one of the most taught of the Word of God generations of all time or at least access to being taught and who in this country born here at least my generation could could rightfully stand and say I've not known I've not heard I've not had access to the truth what a, a blatant lie that would be this is this is a gospel saturated society as it is but there's a truth that's not held, it's not cherished, it's not longed for, it's known but not embraced. It's held in unrighteousness. It's, it's a casual, convenient thing that we can run back to when things get too tough. When the rain starts, we can run to the, we know where the ark is, so when the rain starts, we can all run there and get safe. But in the interim, let's go and play. In the interim, let's have some fun. In the interim, let's more or less enjoy the things that this life has to offer it's holding the truth in unrighteousness never brought to the place of understanding what it fully means to be part of the body of Jesus Christ because that which may be known of God verse 19 is manifest in them God has showed it to them what they could be the history the, the personal revelation the, the moments in the word, the moments at an altar somewhere, the moments at a youth seminar, the, the, just the moments where God made known. Imagine standing before the throne one day and having held the truth in unrighteousness and suddenly there are no more excuses. Suddenly there, there's nobody to, there to blame and all the smoke is cleared away and God shows us in a moment of time all the opportunities we had for truth how he had clearly made known to us who he was and what he was able to do verse 20 says the invisible things of him from creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so they are without excuse because that when they knew God they glorified him not as God and neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations that means dark in their minds and their foolish heart was darkened professing themselves to be wise they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man to birds the four-footed beasts and creeping things there was a revival apparently in Canada several years ago where there were manifestations like this where they said the Holy Spirit is manifesting in his people and as birds as four-footed beasts and creeping things and it's a direct fulfillment of this scripture changing the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image of man man-centered worship looking for some new superstar prophet or preacher in the pulpit not really laying hold individually of the truths of the Word of God and ultimately having to bring God down to our level for the purpose of indulging our lusts that's what it has always been that's why when Moses went to the mountain they built a golden calf do you want to know why they built a calf because it allowed them to strip off their clothes and run around and begin to play 
That's what Moses found when he came down. He found them naked. He found them involved in all kinds of debauchery. And that's why man has to pull down the image of God. It, it allows him to, to play without conviction as it is. To think somehow that God's the same as I am. The fear of the Lord goes out the window and we're able to craft this image of God who sees and understands and knows our struggle and realizes we're just weak and, and all of these wonderful things in our own mind, which allows us to indulge in licentious sin and never think there's going to be a consequence to it. Wherefore, it says, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own heart to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now when it says God gave them up, it, it just simply means he removed his restraining hand. It's that simple. He just, it's like a, a bunch of people sitting in a parking lot waiting to get in, to be the first in to, to some sale that's happening at a store. And, but there's a restraint there. There's a door, perhaps a security guard. But at some point, the door opens. The security guard moves out of the way. And then it's a, a free-for-all to get in. And this is a type of what this is, not keeping truth in the heart. And the Lord just simply removes his restraining hand. And then there's a free for all. And that's happening in America today. Folks, we, we're living in a nation that's being baptized in filth. It's, it's, if you are a godly person, it has to vex you in your heart. The, it's filth everywhere, filth. In people's conversation, you can't even watch the news without the sexual innu innuendos being made between news commentators. Just filth is, is permeating now Amen. the society. Wherefore God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature. That's, that means that which is created more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. Even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one towards another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient. Verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Not only do they do it themselves, but they have pleasure in watching others do what perhaps they have not yet been able to break the barrier and commit themselves. The, the vicarious enjoyment of other people's sin is exactly the same as participating in it yourself, folks. I have to tell you straight out. There's a great price to pay when we have truth. Yet for whatever reason, at certain seasons in our lives, we choose to hold it very lightly. I think of England at the moment. That there was a court decision rendered just a few weeks ago that a Christian family, which will now probably include all Christian families, is no longer eligible to foster children in their home because they, they cannot, the religious viewpoint does not allow them to agree that homosexuality is an alternative lifestyle. And a judge in a court has come down with a decision now that this family no longer qualifies to take in orphans or just even to care for them momentarily because they will not agree. When's the last time you ever heard that a homosexual couple cannot take in children into their home because their lifestyle does not permit them to agree with the Christian viewpoint and practice in life. We, we are sliding. We are sliding so fast. It's happening so quick, folks. You, you, you must become aware of, of how quickly this is happening. And much of the professing church is going to go with it, I'm afraid. Unless there's an awakening in our generation, a complete and total awakening. I want to show you some examples out of David's life of how we can choose to hold the truth that we know very lightly. Now, you were already in uh, Psalm, uh, or Isaiah, 2 Samuel, rather, uh, chapter 11. Well, you were in 18, but go to 2 Samuel 11 and Psalm 101. And keep your hand 
in both because we're going to go back and forth between these passages of Scripture. Now, Psalm 101 essentially speaks of the truth that David knew. And then when you go back to 2 Samuel 11, we'll see that the lifestyle that David chose to practice at a certain time in his life, a certain moment. Now, thank God he got out, not without consequence, but he, he did get out. Now, Psalm 101, think of the, the sweet psalmist David. Think of yourself singing sweet songs here this morning and how we do love God. I, I know I love God, and I, I know that many here, you love God. You do love him with all your heart. You, you do want to walk with God. Psalm 101, verse 2, David says, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when will you come to me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. This was truth. This was so deep in this man of God. He, he knew what was right. He knew that it was these visitations of God that gave him strength. He said, oh, when will you come to me? He had known these visitations of God. He had, he had known these intimate moments with God and knew that's where his strength had come from to fight the giants and fight the lions and the bears and everything he'd ever done and become had come from these moments of intimacy with God. And he said, I'm going to walk within my house with a, with a perfect heart, a right heart, a God-seeking heart is really what he's saying. Now, keep your hand, Psalm 101. I want you to go back to 2 Samuel 11. Verse 1, it says, at, And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass, verse 2, in the evening tide, that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of, his, of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. You see, it was a time for battle. Others were going. David stayed home. We're, we're, we're speaking, teaching, and preaching in this church at this time about the necessity to be involved in the work of God. It's a time for battle. It's a time to be reaching men and women and children with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a time to be living righteously. It's a time for you and I to have that sweet savor of Christ following us everywhere we go. It's a time for the body of Christ to look like the body of Jesus Christ, to be engaged in the work of the body of Jesus Christ, which is and always has been the redemption of fallen humanity. It's a time for you and I to be within our house and say, God, strengthen me. Visit me, O Lord. O Holy Spirit of the living God, touch my mind again. Open the word of God to me. Strengthen me by your power. Lead me, oh God, to somebody today out on the street that just needs to know you. Somebody behind a counter, somebody sitting on a bench, somebody that I meet during the course of the day in my business. Just lead me to somebody. Let me be in the work of God. Others were going. David stayed home. Beware. Beware when you start staying home. Beware when the permitting no longer has a draw for you. Beware. When you start walking around your house or your apartment bored. And that's what happened to David. His spiritual laziness caused him to wander around his house looking for something to do. He wandered around in the evening tide. It says he rose from off his bed. What's, what's he doing getting out of bed when it's just starting to get dark? Don't you go to bed when it gets dark? And he went on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very... Beautiful to look upon. Now go back to Psalm 101, verse 3. Remember verse 2, he says, I'll walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. Now this is truth he knew. Now go back to 2 Samuel, chapter 11. We'll look at the truth he began to practice. And David, verse 3, sent and inquired after the woman. It's like the type of a man, there, it's interesting, there's a send button on, on the computer, isn't there? <laughs> David went and he saw the image and he sent and inquired. And one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of, of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her and she came in unto him and he lay with her for she was purified from uncleanness. 
and she returned to her house. And you can think of what he's thinking in his mind. Well, that wasn't all that bad. I mean, just a little indulgence, a little bit of pleasure. What harm could come from that? I mean, it was done in secret. Who would ever see this thing anyway? And God knows I've fought the battle hard and long and, and tired and, uh, you know, struggling. And the Lord knows I need ministry. You wouldn't believe the logic that we deal with. I mean, some people who commit adultery, then they get on their knees and open their Bibles after the act itself and then encourage one another. It's, it's, it's insanity. Holding the truth in unrighteousness. It doesn't, there's no more of a graphic example than this. David sent, took her, she came, he laid with her. And he, he said, I'll set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Now go back to Psalm 101. We're looking at truth that he knew compared to what he practiced. Verse 6. Mine eyes will be upon the faithful of the land. And they that, that they may dwell with me, and he that walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that works deceit shall not dwell within my house, and he that tells lies shall not tarry in my sight. Now go back to Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 6. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did, how the people are doing, and how is the war prospering. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land. At one time, he looked for fellowship, for strength, to walk with God. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful. In other words, I will not hang around with spiritually like people. I will not associate with those that are mixed. My friends will not be sitting beside me this morning in the house of God declaring themselves Christians and clubbing on Saturday night. I will not associate with that crowd. I will not go there. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful. And he that tells lies will not tarry in my sight. But now he sends for Uriah. Uriah is a faithful man. Uriah, I don't know if Uriah was a godly man, but he was a faithful man. He was loyal. Now his eyes are upon him for deception, for malice, and for cover-up. You have no idea what will get into your heart. The moment any one of us opened that door to immorality in our lives, you, you have no idea what it brings in with it. You, you think you can handle this. You, you don't realize what kind of a man or woman you can become. Every sin known to mankind is just waiting inside of each of us to break out and manifest itself. We're all cut of the same cloth, folks. I don't care how pretty you look. Doesn't matter to me what your education. We're all cut of the same cloth. There's no temptation given but such as is common to man. That means every temptation, you fight, I fight. We're all in this boat together. Psalm 101 verse 7. He that works deceit shall not dwell within my house, and he that tells lies shall not tarry in my sight. Now 2 Samuel chapter 11, again, verse 23. And the messenger said to David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out unto us into the field, and we were unto them even unto the entering of the gate. And the shooters shot from off the wall upon your servants, and some of your king's servants be dead, and thy servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said to the messenger, Thus shalt thou say unto Joab, Let not this thing displease thee, for the sword devours one as well as another. Make thy battle more strong against the city, and overthrow it, and encourage him. Encourage him. He's just murdered. He's just murdered the husband of the wife of the woman that I committed adultery with, but encourage him now. He that tell li tells lies shall not tarry in my sight, but now he's, he's opened his heart and he's opened his home and he's opened his door of his life to liars. Bringing lying messages about lying victories, about lying circumstances. His hand is complicit in all of this. He has no idea at this point in his life, perhaps, what his life has become. Then Psalm 101, last verse, verse 8. He says, I will early destroy all the wicked of the land. 
that I might cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. That's the truth that he knew. But he ended up destroying his own sons. Instead of destroying the wicked, he destroyed four of his own children. There are consequences to sin, folks. Yes, you can be forgiven, but there are consequences. And David knew that. And even though there had been a victory against this uprising against him, he went into his tent crying, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would to God I had died for you, my son Absalom. The sorrow, the joy of victory turned to sorrow. Because he had, his hand had been complicit in the destruction of his own son. It's that simple. Don't think for a second that any one of us can be involved in these things and not pay a price for it. There is a terrible price to pay for these things. But the hope for everyone who's caught today is that there was another father who oversaw the destruction of his own son so that you and I could be free. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord laid on his son. He allowed his son to go to a cross. And he laid on him the wrath of God that you and I deserve. He laid on him the wrong that we have done. He laid on him the beating that we deserve. He laid on him the full dispensation of God's justice. So that we could be free as a people. So that we could literally walk out of prison. So we could walk in freedom. We could walk with a new heart. We could walk with a new mind. The article that I read in Time Magazine made an incredible statement. The addiction clinics face a serious problem. They can partially offer relief from the manifestations. But they don't know how to set people free from the core issues of their behavior. And their, their ethical dilemma is this is a natural desire that's deep within the DNA of humanity. How then, other than total abstinence, how do we deal with it? And even abstinence doesn't deal with it. How do people get free? They're actually in a dilemma because even addiction clinics now, drug and alcohol addiction clinics in America are being inundated. They're being infused. They're being overwhelmed by people looking for freedom from sexual addiction. It's a plague, folks in this country right now. The only answer that I can give you has stood the test of time for over 2,000 years now. Isaiah 53, 5 says, by his stripes, we are healed. There's no other answer needed. Jesus stood in the temple he opened the word of God. And many in his generation must have been captivated by similar things. Perhaps not to the depth that we are today in our society. But he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. And the recovering of sight to the blind and to set free those that have been bruised. And to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say to them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now these words are absolutely true. The anointing of the spirit of God can let you go in a moment of time. If I didn't believe that, then I have to lay down the right to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I happen to believe that God can set you free in a moment of time. I happen to believe that there's enough power in the blood of Jesus Christ and the cross of Jesus Christ. I happen to believe that when Jesus Christ said it is finished, every prison door the devil had was open. And just like Paul and Silas, when they began to sing in prison, it said the whole place shook and every door opened and everyone's chains fell off. No one here has to be a slave to any sin. You are free. Jesus said you'll know the truth and the truth shall make you free.
I came to give you life and I came to give it more abundantly. The thief comes just to kill, steal, and destroy everything you've got. But I came that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. <laughs> Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. No weapon formed against you can prosper. No ropes can hold you. No chains can bind you. No prison door can keep you. You are the bride of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Glory to God. Glory to the name of God. Glory to the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for freedom. Thank you, God, for freedom. Hallelujah for freedom. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, these words are absolutely true. But just like the prodigal son who took his inheritance and went where he shouldn't have gone, and he ended up in a field feeding pigs. He was, he was allowing, he was enabling that which he knew to be unclean to survive in his life. But suddenly he came to himself, said, what am I doing here? I've got to get up and get back to my father, back to my father's house, back to my father's work, back to everything that my father is, back to all that my father has. And I don't care if he makes me a servant in the house. It doesn't matter to me. That's where life is. That's where power is. That's where the joy of the Lord is. <laughs> to be free, you and I have to have a determination. We all do in this church. We all do in this generation that our faces will not be found in the hog trough of immorality. We're not going there. We're not living there. We're not staying there. That God's going to give us all the power to walk through this filthy generation with the glory of God in our heart and in our soul. The best advice that I can give to you this morning is don't stay at home and don't be spiritually lazy. Get up and get back to the work of God. Get involved in the work of God. You find yourself listless. You find yourself with nothing to do at night. You find yourself wandering around lonely. Just get up. Get on the elevator. Go down. Go out in the street. Find somebody that needs to know Jesus Christ. Start telling people about God. You know there's a hungry family in your building. Go across to the supermarket. Buy a little box of groceries and take it. Knock on the door. Tell them that Jesus loves them. Get involved in the work of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. That's where the power and strength of God is. That's where your eyes begin to see clearly. Your ears start hearing from God. Your feet start having the bounce of God in them. You're not led by those inner cravings of every human being that will find their expression when you are not in the battle. Hallelujah. You boil it down really to one of the deepest problems we face is we have an absolutely lazy generation of Christianity. People coming to church so lazy that all they want to do is be given a piece of cake and a cup of coffee so they can put their feet on the altar rail and just continue to be lazy even in the house of God. No reverence, no fear of God, no, no sense of understanding of what this is all about. No armor, no battle, no prayer life, no prayer meeting, no, no nothing. And the enemy just comes like a flood and overpowers them. This flood of filth is, is, is literally overpowering much of the professing church of Jesus Christ. But thanks be to God, my Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of God will come upon us, every one of us, and give us the power to stand in an evil time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Praise be to God. The Bible says clearly to the Apostle Paul, 
as we behold him, Jesus, as our eyes are fixed on him, his victory, his work, his heart, his word, as our eyes are fixed on him, we shall be changed even as by the spirit of our God. From image to image and glory to glory, every day growing in grace as the world is dissipating into darkness. Every day becoming stronger as those without God are becoming weaker. Every day filled with more compassion as the world around us is starting to divide into camps of hatred. Every day new vision, new sight, new hearing, new speech. Every day the power of God manifesting more and more. Every day, every day becoming more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Every day longing and yearning for another opportunity to share Christ in this lifetime. Every day waiting for the call of God, the power of God, the purpose of God to be made known in our lives. Every day living to glorify God. Every night going back to our apartment, putting our feet in our bed, giving God glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Lord Jesus Christ, raise up your church in this generation. My God, my God, put us into your work. Put us into your work, oh God. Bring us home as a people, Father. Father, we thank you, we bless you, we praise you. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I'm not giving an altar call this morning. I don't want anybody here taking advantage of your vulnerability. But we're in a moment all going to stand together. And individually, would you ask the Lord, the Bible says, be clean. Be ye clean who bear this treasure of God in these earthen vessels. Would you ask him for the power? Would you repent if you have to? Would you ask him for the power to put away that which offends the testimony of Christ in your life? Whatever that is. Now listen to me carefully. Praying this prayer today does not mean you will walk out of this service and never be tempted again. It doesn't mean that. Temptation is part of what we have to endure here while on this planet Earth and in these physical bodies. But what it does mean is that you don't have to open the door, you don't have to sit anything down, you don't have to start entertaining it. You, God gives the power to walk away from what you need to walk away from. In order to walk away from something that you shouldn't have, you have to see what you should have. You have to see the life that can be yours, the joy, the power, the freedom, that none of these things can offer. They offer temporary pleasure and permanent captivity. Hallelujah. But Jesus offers permanent strength, permanent life, permanent joy. We're going to worship for about 10 or 15 minutes. And will you just take this to God? Husbands and wives, would you hold each other's hands if you're here together and married and profess a renewed loyalty one to another? Young people, trust God for the power to keep you. And for those who are older, set the example. Conversation and purity and charity. Help those that are younger to learn what it looks like to be a Christian. But to be godly examples in this church. And we're going to stand and just worship. You may want to lift your hands. You do whatever you feel you need to do. But let's, let's ask the Lord to, that the Times Square Church, we are in the middle of, I don't want to call it hell, but it's pretty close, I think, in Times Square. Every sensual pleasure of the eye, it's all here now. We're a church right smack in the middle of it. But it is possible for God to keep us. That we can be a clean people. Bearing the treasure of Christ in these vessels. 
in our city and in our generation. It is possible. And don't let the devil rob you of the potential for your victory today. Remember that your prison door is already open. It's really for you just to walk out. It's already open. The enemy will try to convince you you'll never get out. But you can get out. Because the victory is already won. Let's stand please together. We're going to worship for at least 10 minutes. Father, thank you that you love us, Lord. When you met that son on the road coming home, you covered him. You didn't condemn him. You just covered him. And you put a ring of authority on his hand. You gave him power over his enemies. And that's what you do, Lord, for us. You give us power over anything that would seek to have power over us. That's who you are. You make great and precious promises that by these we become partakers of your divine nature. Thank you for your promises. We can't promise you anything, Lord. We can't keep it. But your promises to us, Lord. That's where our strength and our freedom is, Lord. Then you put shoes on our feet. Say, my son, my daughter, we have much to do. We have many places to go. There are many hungry hearts waiting for a word of love and life. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that we stand by grace alone. You are so good and your mercy endures forever, Lord. That's just who you are. That's our only boast. There's no other boast we can bring. We can't bring a, a legacy, a litany of wonderful things we've done to people, but only what you did on the cross 2,000 years ago. Oh, God Almighty, I thank you, Lord, that you will have a people who do escape the snares of this life, who will walk in a right way before you and before man. Thank you, Father, that anyone, anyone here today who longs for freedom will have it. You've already done it. When you said it is finished, it's finished, Lord. It's already finished. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Bless and keep us as your people. Bless and keep this church, Lord, in this hour that we're living in. Oh, God, we're going to have to walk through a cesspool of filth in the coming days and years. But, Lord, you'll keep us. You promised to keep us. And we thank you for it. Lord, it's just all about you, Lord. We just thank you. Just lift your hands and thank him for keeping you. Just thank him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Just lift your voice to him right now, just for a moment. Just thank him for his keeping power. Thank him for setting you free. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him with everything that's in your heart. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. We're going to sing one more song before we go. It's called, You Are Stronger. You Are Stronger. Sin is Broken. He is stronger. He is stronger. Hallelujah. Let's sing that song together, then after we're finished singing it, take time to encourage one another. Brothers and sisters, we're all in this together, and we are going to finish this race. Thank God.